So looking back at the last 25 years, the two uh, major changes were that cryptography went from secret to public and from art to science. Ever since, we've, we've seen more and more examples where something that seems intrinsically contradictory can in fact be solved. And so I'd like to propose this meta theorem of cryptography that any apparently contradictory set of requirements can in fact be met with the right mathematical approach. In which jurisdiction did this online transaction take place? Is there a tax on this transaction? And if so, who should pay it and who should collect it? Did this online transaction break any laws? Whose laws? I don't know the answer to most of these questions, and I suspect many of you don't either. I think the challenges for us would be far more social than, uh, than technical going forward. There's a, a part of this society that, that so it feels like it needs total protection. Another part that feels like we can't protect society unless this so-called so secure system is really not quite as secure as you would like to think. So how you balance those two competing interests, I don't know. And when you try and do it in an international environment, it's far more complex. So this is the panel on information and data security, and uh, who more qualified to lead us than a, a computer scientist with a very promising future. Uh, Vint, would you like to take the stage and introduce your panel? So uh, let me ask the panel to, uh, to join me on the stage. It doesn't matter what order you come up on, folks. You know, I'll call on you in some random order anyway. There's an algorithm behind this, but I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> Jim Plotz. So uh, first of all, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, lead the last panel of the day. I'm sure you've been waiting for this, um, especially if you're interested in uh, uh, lunch. Uh, also, I, I want to note, after you've uh, perused some of the um, biographies of the people on the panel, that this is the Stanford response to the Berkeley hardware panel. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that Don Knuth and I may be the only two people wearing three-piece suits in this room. And uh, like many others, I'd never see Don in a three-piece suit either. That was pretty amazing. Uh, the people who are joining me uh, on the panel include uh, Adi Shamir, who I just wave hands as I introduce you. There's no order here, right? So Adi there is the 2002 Turing Award winner for his work on the invention of the RSA algorithm. Uh, he's a professor of mathematics at Weizmann and also an invited professor at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, he uh, got his uh, BS in mathematics uh, at Tel Aviv and a master's and PhD at Weizmann Institute. And I'm not going through other details of all of his uh, personal life and everything else because you can read that on the net. Just Google Adi Shamir. Uh, Bob Kahn, where's Bob? There's Bob, uh, is uh, the chairman, CEO, and president of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives and the 2004 Turing Award winner for his work on the internet. Uh, his career goes from Bell Labs to professor at MIT to Bull Baranek and Newman to uh, DARPA as the director of the Information Processing Techniques Office and then founder uh, and now CEO of CNRI. Uh, he has the National Medal of Technology, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Award, and many other ACM Software Systems Award, and as a member of uh, quite a number of, uh, of our institutions, including uh, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has a BEE, uh, Bachelor's in Electrical Engineering from City College, and an MA and PhD from Princeton. Uh, Ron Ravis, where's Ron? Right there. Ron is also the 2002 uh, Turing Award uh, awardee for his work, again, on uh, the RSA algorithm. He's the R in the RSA. Uh, he's a fellow of, uh, I'm sorry, he's a professor of computer science at MIT. Uh, he is also connected with the uh, CSAIL uh, organization, uh, Artificial Intelligence Group at MIT uh, in crypto and info security. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, ACM, uh, AAAS, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the recipient of the Paris Kanellakis Award. He has a BA from Yale and a PhD from Stanford. Yay! 
<clears throat> and finally, uh, John Hopcroft. Where's John over there? Uh, John is the 1986 Turing Awardee. Uh, he's a professor of engineering and applied mathematics at Cornell. Uh, he studied at Princeton and, uh, and then, I'm sorry, he worked at Princeton and then went to Cornell where he spent most of his professional career. He's a member of both the National Academy of Science and the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the ACM uh, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, AAAS and IEEE, and was appointed to the National Science Board in 1992, which oversees the expenditures of the National Science Foundation. It's actually a very serious position. He has a BS uh, from the University of, uh, John, it says Seattle in my notes, am I, am I correct? correct? And then an MS, MS and PhD from Stanford University. Yay. <coughs> <coughs> Meet Cal. So. I know some of them will be in after the conference, there'll be some confrontation out there in the hall. Ready. Yeah. Good. <laughs> So let me uh, just open uh, by making a few uh, remarks and then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to spend no more than five minutes uh, with some of their thoughts on this topic so we can then get to the questions which I hope will be forthcoming from the audience. First of all, I am persuaded that strong authentication of everything, of devices, of people and digital objects is going to be very, very important to us in the future. If we are unable to identify the origins of things, uh, their uh, parentage, so to speak, or provenance, uh, we are going to be in more trouble than we're in already uh, as we look at a very fragile environment as it is. Two-factor authentication, again, being an important theme because uh, reusable passwords have turned out to be terrible. We're very bad at selecting them to begin with. I am given uh, on good authority that there are still people who use the word password as their password because it's easy to remember. Uh, unfortunately, so do other people know that and uh, there's trouble with, as a result. I also think it's going to be important for us to distinguish between identifiers and identity, by which I mean identity, human identity, and identifiers are simply labels. And I think we should not allow those to become confused. I think that by making the distinction, we permit anonymous speech, we permit a variety of other things that disconnect the human uh, from other activities. And I believe that's very important in this increasingly networked world. I also think that networks, uh, the network or the internet or other networks continue to evolve. Some new technologies are coming along. This is not the last word in networking by any means. Even the network, it's the internet itself has been evolving. Just last Wednesday, we launched IP version 6. Uh, that's the 128-bit address space for the internet. I, I used to go around saying that every electron in the universe can have its own web page now. <laughs> until somebody pointed out, Caltech, dear Dr. Surf, you jerk, there's 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe, and you're off by 50 orders of magnitude. So I don't say that anymore. <laughs> Uh, but I see new kinds of networking technology, for example, uh, the open flow system uh, out of Stanford University uh, is a very, very interesting and more rich uh, kind of, um, has a more rich uh, routing capability than simply focusing on topology and addresses. Uh, this gets close to content, uh, content uh, kinds of uh, routing which uh, other people um, have been working on. So I see very big opportunities for continued evolution in that space. I also think that uh, although the layered structure of the internet is not the only way to build things, one of the things which results from it has been emergent properties. And I think we've not talked very much about emergence in uh, the last day and a half or so, but it's my belief that um, abstraction and emergent properties are very important for us to understand in, in order to try to cope with the complexity of the systems that we've been designing. Now, speaking of designing systems, uh, I'm persuaded that uh, we've done a poor job of uh, protecting ourselves from uh, attacks against operating systems directly or attacks against browsers or attacks through browsers. Uh, and in fact, I've been trying to persuade uh, my colleagues uh, who have designed the Android operating system that we need a, uh, a version which is a lot more uh, resistant to attack and that we should call it paranoid. Um, uh, because it should behave as if uh, even, even if they're, just because it's paranoid doesn't mean they're not after it. Uh, 
And finally, I wanted to suggest to you that uh, not only in the context of this panel, but I think in the more general context of computer science, that systems design and architecture, systems engineering, and understanding complexity and the behavior of systems is vitally important and not adequately taught in most of our curriculum. I think that without the focus of attention on architecture and, uh, and the way in which systems work, that we will um, create a very, very fragile uh, future, a brittle one, and that's not what people deserve nor what they expect of us. So I'll stop there and I will ask uh, if we could begin uh, with Addy uh, to speak a bit about uh, the future of, or, or maybe the presence of, and the future of cryptography and whatever else you think is important. Addy. So, well, So I was actually asked to say something uh, profound about uh, Turing and uh, uh, the enigma and the code breaking during Second World War. And uh, coming up with profound things is the easy part. The, the hard part, of course, is to make sure that they fit within 140 characters. If you attach it to your left nostril, it really <laughs> works well. <laughs> Can everyone hear me now? Good. Yeah, you still won't make any sense, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Addy. I couldn't resist. <laughs> so, um, if uh, we think about uh, uh, the fight between the code makers and the code breakers during Second World War, uh, the common wisdom is to think that this was triumph of human ingenuity over stupid machines, the Enigma machines and the other encoding machines. I would like to suggest a totally different uh, view of what really happened. Uh, if you look carefully at what were the achievements of the British uh, during this uh, uh, struggle, um, I would say that uh, a, a much better way to characterize what happened was that it was the triumph of machine intelligence over human stupidity. And let me explain. Uh, if uh, um, the way that uh, the British uh, managed to break the German enigma was uh, to build a, a blindingly fast machine that was way ahead of its time in terms of how many uh, uh, operations per second it could perform. And uh, uh, the other major way in which uh, the British succeeded was in uh, uh, exploiting very, very well all the small mistakes that the German operators were doing while running the encryption algorithm. So if uh, I take uh, Raj Redis, for example, uh, the definition yesterday, that machine intelligence uh, might actually be a lot of... Uh, uh, of brute force with some pre-programmed uh, shortcuts, what the British were doing uh, was eliminating the effect of one part of the Enigma machine, which is called the plug board. I'll not get in, into the technical details. But most of the other elements of the Enigma were broken by exhaustive search. You don't know what is the initial state of those three rotors. You just run through all the possibilities. You don't know what is, uh, the, uh, which uh, subset of three out of the five rotors were used. You run through all the possibilities, and so on and so on. So actually, most of the uh, uh, elements in the Enigma were broken by exhaustive search techniques. On the other hand, if the machine had been used properly in the way it was uh, designed to be, um, the British would have a very hard time breaking it. So for example, uh, against all the uh, regulations, some operators uh, sent a message encrypted under some key and then sent exactly the same message again but abbreviating some words encrypting it under the same key. So this gave the, the British cryptanalyst an encryption of one message and then encrypted of a slightly shifted version of the same message under the key and uh, this was uh, the starting point uh, of a wonderful attack. 
Another example, uh, it was uh, uh, the fact that uh, the German operators liked to use consecutive letters as uh, uh, message keys or they like to use the initials of uh, their girlfriends, etc. There was just a long list of blunders, and each and every one of them was uh, very ingeniously used by the uh, uh, British uh, cryptanalyst. So uh, if you had a chance to meet uh, General Felgibel, who was the head of, uh, in charge of uh, secure communication in the uh, Wehrmacht uh, in Second World War, and ask him, uh, why did your systems fail? He will probably uh, have to tell you the truth, that there were two basic reasons. He underestimated the ability of the British to run a very large number of computations, and he overestimated the ability of his people not to make mistakes. So that's something to remember. Thank you, Adam. I'm very impressed, uh, Adi. You, you actually completed slightly before your time. I'm ex uh, impressed. Uh, you must have hardware background or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me invite Ron Rivest now to take uh, the, uh, the lectern. Thank you, Vin. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful celebration. Uh, marvelous to see the, the cast of characters here and uh, people like Adi who never wear a three-piece suit. <laughs> so I'd like to thank ASIM for organizing it. Uh, I'd like to cover just two points in my remarks here. The first relates to Turing's contributions to cryptography, and I have sort of an unusual point of view to make on this, something he doesn't get credit for, but maybe he should. And the second relates to sort of the unhappy marriage of cryptography and computer security today. Starting in the first, Turing's contributions to cryptography are well known, and Adi alluded to, to some of that. Uh, it's well known he played a major role in the breaking of the German and Enigma cipher by the Allies, and this cryptanalytic triumph certainly shortened the war and may have been decisive in the Allies' victory. However, he didn't pu Turing didn't publish papers on cryptography, and his contributions to the unclassified academic field, at least, are at best indirect. It's known that he traveled to the US, for example, and uh, Princeton, met with Claude Shannon while he was there, and probably had a large influence on Shannon's first paper, The Mathematics of Secrecy, uh, which was probably simulated by conversations with Turing. Uh, some of his classified papers are becoming uh, declassified, um, D2 were just declassified this year, and they're interesting, but I suspect the heart of his uh, World War II contributions still remain to become, to become declassified. In any case, these papers have had little impact on academic cryptography as it's practiced today. So I'd like to argue briefly, and perhaps provocatively, however, that Turing's work on artificial intelligence has had a major impact on mod modern cryptography. How so? Consider the two very interesting and hard questions. When is a computer system intelligent? Or when is a computer system, a cryptographic system, secure? These are hard questions, and getting the definitions right is tough. And Turing had a brilliant insight into how to how might do that. His genius was to provide an operational definition of intelligence in the form of a game. To be precise, he wasn't trying to define intelligence, but to identify critical properties it should have that were testable. But nonetheless, his definition was essentially that of a game. His game is asked if an examiner can distinguish between a man and a computer by asking it, it questions. Actually, last night I asked Siri if she was intelligent. And she said, I can't answer that. <laughs> I asked, why not? She says, you see things and you say, why? But I dream of things that never were. And I, and I, and I say, why not? <laughs> Turing would have loved playing with Siri, I think. <laughs> but the notion of indistinguishability as a test, as a, as a means of defining a difficult notion, was a brilliant contribution by Turing. The end result is that something is identified as being intelligent if it's indistinguishable from something accepted as being intelligent. And the same approach now pervades academic cryptography. This began with the work of Goldwasser and Macaulay and has been extended by Blum, Yao, Bellari, Rugaway, and many others. For example, we now see that a bit generator is random or pseudo-random if it is indistinguishable from a random source, a true random source. Similarly, we ask if an if an encryption algorithm is indistinguishable from a family of randomly generated permutations between the message space and the ciphertext space and so on. If an adversary can't distinguish between the ideal object, an ideal random object, and our real world instantiation of it using a guessing game very similar to that of Turing's imitation game, then it's good enough for all practical and theoretical purposes. So I say that the Turing test was not only a fundamental contribution to AI, but it also provided the paradigm for much of modern research in cryptography. End of first part. 
Second part, I would like to talk about the unhappy marriage between cryptography and computer security. I'd like to start with a riddle. Abraham Lincoln loved this riddle. If you call a tail of a dog a leg, how many legs does the dog have? <laughs> well, of course, the answer is four. It doesn't matter what you call the tail, it's still a tail. Cryptographers commit the same sort of error when they call a string a secret key. Calling a bit string secret doesn't actually make it secret. <laughs> yeah. That's very good. The old saying goes, if wishes were horses, then beggars would ride. Today's version goes, if, if wishes were secure software, then we'd all be voting securely on the internet. <laughs> but wishing doesn't make key secret or voting system secure. The label is not the reality. Unless, of course, you're in marketing or sales. <laughs> Cryptographers tend to live a bit in a fantasy world where Alice and Bob can do modular exponentiations in their head, <laughs> where all the digital devices are totally trustworthy and would never betray them. Cryptographers call these assumptions, but they're really just nice wishes. In the real world, we depend upon digital devices to do our modular exponentiations and to keep our so-called secret keys actually secret. Somebody has to do a lot of hard work along the lines of wish fulfillment for the cryptographers. This marriage contract goes along the following lines. The computer security folks depend on the cryptographers to provide crypto methods that can guard and authenticate information sent over communication channels. In return, the computer security folks must give cryptographers computer systems that can actually keep secret to secret. This is not a fair trade, it seems. The cryptographer's job is actually the much easier of the two, even though itself is highly non-trivial. We're seeing an increasing amount of evidence that our computer systems are trying to do too much so that from a security perspective, it is often not done well enough. There's a robust market for zero-day vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that no one else has noticed, ready to be exploited. The recent disclosures of Stuxnet and Flame illustrate further how much how far we really are from solving the computer security problem. Perhaps it really isn't a solvable problem. Maybe we should rethink and revise our assumptions and work on, on assumptions of the sort. Smart secret keys are kept secret most of the time. People perform the correct protocols most of the time. Operating systems protect parties from each other most of the time, and so on. We need an attitude adjustment so that we are prepared to live with, detect, and recover from repeated failures of our security mechanisms, including the repeated loss of cryptographic keys. Some of the style can be modeled in a nice game theoretic manner. You can see some beginnings of such a theory in my talks and slides on the game of Flip It on my website. We also need new public key infrastructure techniques that are compatible with frequent key updates. This is another of the projects I'm working on. MIT's Aeronautics and Astronautics Department recently released a report entitled Aircraft Engine aircraft engineered with failure in mind may last longer. That is, robust aircraft design is now done where designers assume that other components may not be functioning properly, try to make the overall design robust enough that it will still land safely even if some parts don't function. This is not just the usual triple redundant hydraulic systems, but testing whether the system can be landed even when the rudder fails completely. I spend quite a bit of time these days thinking on voting, about voting systems and trying to make them secure. The morals are doubly relevant for voting systems for lots of reasons I really don't have the time to go into here, but you really can't give people the, the means of selling their votes and so on. Um, so I recommend voting on paper ballots, and staying away from internet voting. So to sum up, we've got uh, the technology to build enormously complex and interesting systems, but we have much yet to learn about how to build software that is robust and resilient when attacked. The promise of cryptography won't be realized until these software foundations are better studied, much sturdier, and secret keys are more than merely labeled as secret. So that concludes my remarks. Yeah, I always thought AI stood for artificial idiot, but apparently I got that wrong. I, somebody else asked Siri, what's the meaning of life? And what came back was, uh, okay. I find it odd that you would ask this of an inanimate object. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to call on Bob Kahn to uh, uh, make his remarks, opening remarks, and then uh, we'll come to uh, John Hopcrop. We're going to Bob first and then John. Okay. Okay, thank you, Vint. Uh, thank you. Happy to be here, everybody. Uh, this is a really great event, and I thank uh, ACM 
for uh, enabling it and organizing it. Uh, I'd like to make my remarks today about the general topic of managing information in the internet environment. Uh, this is actually something that I believe uh, we draw uh, quite a bit from the field of mathematics and computation. In fact, I will, programming languages themselves have a lot to contribute here, as you'll see from some of my remarks, and I only wish we understood better how to deal with the problem of programming languages in this large distributed environment better than we do today. Uh, one important component of this, uh, besides the notion of abstraction, which is going to pervade this talk, is the, con is the concept of persistence, which I think we need to think about very carefully in terms of managing information. You'd like information that you make available today, in many cases, to be available for the long term. 100 years, 1,000 years, it depends on what that is, with full security, of course. Um, I think another important element is interoperability of different systems, identifier systems, uh, repositories of information, uh, federated registries, and so forth. Um, a third key element is the ability of this whole collection of uh, capabilities to evolve over time and for information to remain accessible even though all the underlying technology may change many times in the course of even a decade, much less a hundred or a thousand years. So I want to start with the fundamental assumption that the key to managing information in the long term really revolves around the use of unique persistent identifiers. Now this is not something that we take for granted today, but I think it's going to be critical in the future since things will be in different places and we need to understand how to reference them in some arbitrary and, and yet uh, directly resolvable way. These ideas, these identifiers in fact can be pretty much opaque um, and yet uh, ultimately this notion of persistence is going to depend upon uh, first and foremost, the uh, ability to resolve them and manage the information itself. Um, abstraction itself is a hard concept to, to gather, often uh, in the context of existing systems for which the abstraction is trying to represent at a higher level. For example, in the field of mathematics, uh, you know, in the early days, the way formulas were often referenced is by reams of paper with tables. And so the idea that when calculus was introduced that y equals x squared could have all the expressive power of all the reams of paper with all of these tables it was really very hard for many people to accept. Um, I think we have some of the same issues today in physics, but I think the internet is another exist uh, interesting example. Um, many view the internet as a network. Uh, some think of it just as a virtual net, but I've never really thought of it that way. I mean, if I had to describe it, I would say it's a global information system. It helps things get routed. Um, but ultimately, it's a way to take the components of the internet, the networks and the computers, and make them all work together. And that's something that Vint and I worked on uh, for many years, both at the level of developing the technology and then making it work out in practice. The important thing about the internet, in my view, is that it really is independent of all the underlying technology. It is an abstraction of what needs to happen independent of what technologies might show up in the future. So it's not about any particular network. It's not about any particular computer. It's all about the protocols and procedures that make them all work together. So while these underlying technologies have undergone major change in the last decade or 40 years since the internet ideas were really first uh, put forth by us, I think the fundamental assumption we have to make is that in, in 100 or 1,000 years, everything could be completely different. And so if we're going to have things uh, last during that period, we need to be able to think at a much higher level of uh, extraction than we do today. Um, in fact, the notion of identifiers is really not new. Uh, they've been around for a long time, and people have used them in non-technical ways as well as technical ways. But historically, in the technical world, they have been very tightly tied and integrated with the technology itself. So let me give you some examples. In the ARPANET, the very first of the computer networks uh, that was in fact the area where Vin and I first got to know each other, uh, the addressing in the internet was via identifiers that it identified the wire to which a machine was connected, in essence. And so in 100 or 1,000 years, it's not a very useful thing to say 
you know, I'm talking about the machine which was connected to wire 17 on the ARPANET. Nobody will have any clue what that is. The ARPANET isn't even around anymore. Uh, when those wires ended up going to different networks, we were then in the world of internetworking. And that's where the term eventually came from. We called it internetworking initially, but it was all about making these things work together. Well, if your packets are now going to another network, uh, what's that network supposed to do with it? And so we ended up with the notion of IP addresses, which was a kind of a global way of describing a particular machine that this whole universe could then eventually route to. And when the web came along, they talked about files on particularly designated machines. Then if you object to any of this, let me know. Um, when the publishers came around, um, they were talking about essentially putting digital materials on the digital bookshelf. And they wanted to have many of the same properties that was just for a regular uh, bookshelf, such as if you went to a reference at the back, in this case it would be clickable or maybe blinkable or thinkable maybe, uh, you wanted that to essentially get to the material that you would get to if you were in a physical world where the references could be found on that bookshelf in that library. Well, the problem is that if they used any of the existing technology uh, at the time, like URLs, it's unlikely to last even 10 years, much less 100 or 1,000 years. So they knew that something different was really needed. And so uh, what we ended up doing was saying, let's have identifiers literally identify the data structures themselves, independent of what technology might house it now or in the future. So if you knew an identifier for a particular data structure, and you tried to access it in a thousand years, if somebody had managed that information and knew that the identifier corresponded to this data structure, it doesn't matter what the computers are, the storage systems, whatever, you ought to be able to, to get to it. That's the idea, and that's essentially why the publishing industry went down that particular path. Um, and we have had on the uh, net now for almost 20 years a uh, system that does a resolution of these kinds of identifiers. We call it the handle system. It's really out there in the public interest. Uh, it's been very widely adopted. I would say most of the science, technology, and medical information uh, in, the, in the world is, is represented that way, including, for example, virtually every one of the ACM articles. These are branded by the publishers what they call DOIs, which is a shorthand version of digital object identifier. But it's really talking about digital objects in the context that Vint was talking about earlier. Namely, uh, these are persistent ways of identifying this information such that you can always access it. So let me, I don't have much time left, but let me just briefly describe the components of the architecture without going into any real de details. And I use the term digital object in the, in the sense that I think Vint meant too, as being different from object-oriented program, which was intended to hide all the the data abstractions from the programmers so they could all deal with methods. Here, the fundamental thing are the data structures. And we wanted to have a way for people to manage and say those data structures could be medical records, it could be intellectual property, they could be contracts, they could be virtually anything representable in a digital form, and allow the owners of that to deal with the methods by virtue of authorizing others to use it or licensing them. It's a very different kind of model than the object-oriented world. Um, so that's where we ended up. And in this kind of resolution system, you can take these identifiers and map them into really interesting things about these data structures, including things like where you can find it on the net, uh, what kind of uh, terms and conditions apply to its use, authentication information, if you want to know it's really valid, things that really will be important in the long run. If in the 1920s somebody had walked up to virtually any of the technologists in the audience, assuming that you were around then, and said, we have this great technology. It consists of, in this hand, a semiconductor chip, and in this hand, a CPU chip, and you've never seen one of them before. You might have had an idea that there was some real potential there, but there was a big gap between having those components in hand and knowing what to do with them. And that's part of the issue I think we face with some of these architectural challenges. I can tell you what the components are, but we still need to understand how to apply them in a large uh, systemic way. So one of the components that uh, sorry, exists Bob, here. I really need to finish up because you're over time. I'm on my last page. Uh, one of the, uh, the component here is the digital object. That's the lingua franca. 
we need repositories to be able to store these objects and allow them to be accessed using existing storage technology. We need registries that let us find identifiers. The important thing about the repositories is that they are accessible only by identifiers. So that should work in the long term. So just in conclusion, I think what we need to do is agree on some basic conventions um, for managing information. I've listed a few. I think our focus should really be on enabling interoperability between all kinds of different systems with security, because there surely there will be some, and particularly to do it in a context where the technology is continually changing and to ensure that where appropriate investments we make in creating information now will be available in the long term to other generations. Thank you very much. I'm beginning to think that uh, we'll find out whether P equals NP, depending on how long everybody chooses to, uh, to speak. Um, that's, <laughs> so John uh, Hopcroft is next, and I welcome you to the uh, lectern. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here and to listen to, to many exciting talks. And, it, and it's amazing how much I've learned uh, just in the last day or so. What I'd like to do is pick up on a question that was asked yesterday about why Church's uh, lambda calculus is not as famous as the Turing machine model. And uh, Eurus Hartmanis answered that, I believe, very, very well when he said it was the simplicity of the Turing model. Uh, because it was researchers in any branch of science or engineering could understand this model and could understand uh, the notion of, of computability. And one of, one of the things that has not been mentioned about uh, Turing's contribution is what I believe his impact has been on, on education. Uh, because when computer science started as a discipline, there was a question as to what it was going to be like. Was it going to be primarily uh, software engineering and scientific computing, or would it really have a theoretical component? And uh, the work of Turing and the Turing model, which made computability accessible, uh, it turns out that this was a large portion of what was taught in theoretical computer science in, in the 60s. Uh, that and, the, the, of course, the paper by Michael Rabin and Dana Scott on finite automata, which entered introduced the notion of non-determinism, uh, was also uh, a big contributor to our uh, uh, theoretical computer science. But it, it was this theoretical computer science that trained a large number of people uh, to tackle uh, many of the problems that, that have come up. One, one simple example is, I, I believe it was Algol 60 when it was designed, uh, the syntax used the, uh, the formulation of a context-free grammar. And, and I believe that this was the, the language in which there was an amb ambiguity. And it, it depended on which compiler you used as to what certain programs, how they executed. And people quickly discovered that the syntax was ambiguous. And so someone asked, could we write a computer program to determine if a context-free language was ambiguous or not. And uh, fortunately, there were people who understood undecidability and quickly showed that this was an undecidable problem. Uh, and it's the fact that, that the Turing model was so simple and allowed it to be taught and a large number of people to understand this uh, that led people to work on notions like randomness and cryptography and, and algorithms and I'll just conclude with uh, one example of the impact that that may have on the future uh, as we try to do things. Uh, one of the problems we may want to do in the future is digitize medical records uh, so that you could go anywhere in the world. If you went to a hospital, the doctor could pull up your entire medical record. Uh, but you may not want your insurance company to know uh, your entire medical history. Uh, all you want the insurance company to know is that they need to pay a given doctor or a given hospital a certain amount of money. They don't need to know what that money is, is for. All they need is a rigorous mathematical proof that, that they owe. Uh, <laughs> similar, 
researchers are going to want to have access to, to this kinds of medical records so that they can uh, do various statistical tests. But once again, you don't want researchers to have any information about your, your personal uh, medical history. And the, the future, there's going to be large systems like this that we are going to have to create in computer science. And it's because this country has built a, a strong base in theoretical computer science that I think we're going to be able to make major progress on this. And I think that the simplicity of Turing's model actually played a role, uh, a major role, in, in the way education evolved in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that wonderful uh, collection of uh, observations, we can jump into the questions that have come from the floor. Uh, I, I, I made up a question, though, that uh, may not be appropriate for the panel, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, it has to do with this. We, we talked about computation, and it always strikes me as being mostly about calculating uh, some value. So there's computation. There's theory of computation which we talked a lot about just in the previous panel. And then there's the practice of computation, making things work, maybe supercomputers uh, computers that are doing scientific computations. And then there's all the other stuff that we do with computers. And somehow that doesn't quite qualify as computation. It's, I'm not sure I can imagine a Turing machine tweeting, for example. So um, oh, I'm sure I'll have some debate with the church uh, uh, and Lambda theory guys about that after this session is over. But the point I want to make is that we do an awful lot of stuff with computers that isn't classical computing, and that seems to be where all the problems are. Um, all right, so here's an example of that. Here's a question from Brian Milnes. He says, why are we not running type safe operating systems and sy uh, such, uh, such systems, uh, would, and would they, in fact, help security if we had um, programming languages and computers that were typing the various categories of content so that you couldn't perform an incorrect operation or an inappropriate operation. Would that help and would it improve security? And I guess this is going to the security guys, but anybody who wants to respond as well. Probably it would help, yes. I'm not a programming language person per se, but to, you know, reducing the chance of error. Is, yeah, the ch reducing the chances of error uh, seems like a great idea, so if programming languages can help you program more reliably, uh, sure, but uh, so this, and we're, we're seeing progress in that direction. So this it probably should have been asked during the programming previous, language previous uh, yeah. event as well. Buffer overflow is still up there. Uh, I, one I, one I thing I hope... Comment. Uh, yes. I, just following on on what I said in my opening remark, the uh, computer security is actually uh, all about the interaction between uh, human beings and machines. And most of the mistakes are made by humans. And in this case, if you have the perfectly secure machine, but it is operated by people who are making mistakes, I don't think you'll solve the security problem. Bob? Yeah, I, I want to broaden the question out a little bit and say that this notion of typing also potentially has a major role to play in the internet writ large. I mean, today, the challenges of cybersecurity often amount to looking for needles in proverbial haystacks, digital haystacks. And I think if we had a way of dealing with objects that were typed when they came in and you only used them for the purpose that was declared, then okay, so you may get a really lousy thing coming in playing on your song thing, but it wouldn't crash your system. And if it came in saying this was attempting to modify your operating system, because that's the only thing that you would want to do with it, then somebody might want to take a, look, a more careful look at it. So typing could help in that environment. I think that's a really uh, interesting notion. In fact, uh, when you look at some of the object-oriented uh, systems where you're allowed to say something, the objects talk to you or they, you know, there's a protocol for interacting with an object and you ask it to perform some function on its content and it refuses on the grounds that uh, it's been told it's not allowed to perform that particular function on the content. That's an extension of the notion of typing uh, in some ways. Well, let's, uh, let's see what other questions there are here. Um, here's an example. Dozens of papers claim that problem X can be solved easily if we had public key infrastructure. Why haven't we put a public key infrastructure into operation? Because it's a failure. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, I think we have put some public key infrastructure into operation with certificate authorities, which we now discover 
uh, are penetrable or can be uh, compromised. Um, but are, are any of the public key infrastructures that have been implemented turned out to be useful? So there, there turns out to be a really hard problem. To, I think the problem in part is what do you want out of a public key infrastructure? And you have to not only deal with the cryptography, which is the easy part, but also deal with, with naming different administrative domains and in particular loss of keys and change of keys. Uh, I think that uh, all of these things together uh, have made the initial designs less than what we want, and that's why they're not used except in you know, server-side authentication. But I think we can, we can do it right. I think there's, as, as uh, Don Guth was saying, we can, we can go back and, and revisit some of these problems and, and uh, do them over and do them, do them much, much better. Adi? I'd like to explain why I think uh, they have been a failure. Uh, a few days ago, I looked at the list of certificate authorities, which are automatically trusted by uh, my Mozilla browser. And it had uh, several hundred uh, names, uh, most of which I either don't know or I don't trust. So, uh, Turk Trust, for example. I assume it's trusted, but uh, Izenpe uh, uh, SA. Um, bypass Security, would you trust? Uh, a certificate <laughs> authority whose name is Bypass. Uh, so, the very fact that I have to automatically trust, you know, in security, the main thing is to determine who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Once you make this distinction, life becomes easier. But uh, in a situation where uh, you trust people, uh, certificate authorities in this case, without having any real reason to do it, is a recipe for disaster. Now, on top of it, let's look at what happened in some of the recent uh, attacks. So, uh, uh, in some of the recent uh, well-known cyber attacks, uh, there were either well-signed uh, uh, pieces of software, uh, which uh, were signed, I don't know, with Realtek, uh, as if they were uh, device drivers for Realtek, and they were issued, probably forged, but uh, they seem to be issued by a certificate authority. And uh, in the more recent uh, attacks, uh, somebody actually managed to uh, masquerade a uh, piece of uh, malicious software as if it is part of the normal Microsoft update uh, process. So the whole thing had been a failure if you look at it from a practical point of view. Bob? Just one comment. Uh, your, notion, your notion originally that you should really keep a careful distinction between identity and identifiers, I want to second wholeheartedly, but within the context of identifiers, mapping them to public keys, the handle system has been a PKI system for almost 20 years on the internet. So let's move to, a, a, there are lots of other questions, by the way, that, that relate to cryptography, but uh, I don't want the panel to be completely dominated by, by that, so I'm going to go to a rather uh, more general question. How do you think politics will shape the future of computing in the next 50 years? <laughs> examples, examples of current issues on net neutral are uh, net neutrality, patent warfare. Uh, could you provide some insight into how it has affected us in the past and how you think it will affect us in the future? Wow. I think so you may want to opine on that yourself then. Uh, I was hoping as the moderator I wouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> okay, so first of all, there's no question that what we're seeing right now is a consequence of the dramatic expansion of the use of computers in almost everything. We carry along computers in our mobile phones, in effect. We have you know, 50 or 60 or even more computers in our cars. We have lots of devices that, in the office and at home that uh, contain software and computers. And things go wrong. Bad things happen on the internet. People uh, experience fraud, they get spam, they're attacked, and so on. Legislators believe that their responsibility is to protect the citizens of the country. Sometimes they don't always achieve that goal, but that's what they believe they're supposed to do. And so you, result, you end up with uh, attempts to legislate away some of the problems. Now, earlier, uh, Adi, did, one of the two of you said that uh, just because you label it a secret doesn't keep it a secret. That was wrong. And just because you pass a law saying this shouldn't happen doesn't mean that it won't happen. This is sometimes lost on the legislators. Uh, the important point here, though, is that there's going to be a continuing uh, pressure to try to cope with the abuses that occur in computers and in online network environments. 
And I think the only rational thing that we can do, assuming we don't abandon all of the uh, value that we've seen in having these devices uh, around, is to uh, try to help the legislators understand what makes sense and what does not make sense. And so I uh, commissioned a congressional comic book uh, which explains how the internet works uh, to the uh, members of the uh, legislature. And I'm hoping that that will uh, help part of the, uh, help them understand in some basic way uh, how to pass, how not to pass laws that can't be implemented because that's not how the system works. So the honest answer, in my view anyway, is that we will see a lot of this kind of political uh, pressure uh, coming. The most extreme case of that for software programmers will be the possibility of being liable for a software failure. If you're a civil engineer and you have, and you have that license and you build a bridge or design a bridge and it collapses, if it can be demonstrated that the collapse is a consequence of the design, it's my understanding that there is liability for that civil engineer. If it's materials and construction that's the problem, then that liability goes elsewhere. But it is somewhat terrifying to imagine that we as software people might be liable for the bugs that we put into the software since we've now demonstrated for the last 50 or 60 years that we don't know how to make software that doesn't have bugs in it. Anybody else care to respond? Well, I, apl I applaud, your, um, applaud your attempt on raising the level of technological literacy among uh, Congress. I think that's uh, an area where, can you hear me? Uh, mic up. Can you better? To the left nostril maybe, there. maybe the left nostril of the beard or That's something. It. <laughs> That's it. Uh, uh, <laughs> perfect. Can we get a yeah. Can we get a this, tight shot on that? This works better, right? This works because it's good, I think. <laughs> so I was going to say, uh, I applaud your effort at increasing the level of technological literacy in Congress. I mean, I think it, it, it's abysmally low right now. And, and, uh, Nobody's we, paying attention to what you're saying <laughs> because the microphone is so damn funny. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to see more of you go into Congress is what I'm saying. All right. Anybody else? I, I, I'm probably John. the person on the panel who knows least about how to solve the problem. But being, being a user and so forth, soon, sooner or later someone is going to comment that there is a real drag in our economy. Uh, by just the, the amount of email you get that is junk email, that I, I don't think companies can really use the internet in a certain sense because people don't trust what they get anymore. And, and sooner or later, I, I, th I think uh, there's gonna be a political solution or, the, I mean, the question is, it's becoming one where it, it's affecting, I think, the economy. So this, by the way, this notion of trust has come up in other contexts, and I think it's probably the most uh, important notion. If we, if we cannot ultimately trust the software we use, the networks that we're using, uh, then uh, we won't use them anymore, and that could have a serious impact. Here's an interesting one. Um, wow, it's a really general one. It says, what is the difference between research and problem solving? Well, I'll take a crack at that. I mean, you know, re a research problem is one where you uh, sort of want to go explore a space. Now, problem solving can be part of research, but more often than not, a, a problem solver has a particular problem. They can articulate what it is, and if they got a solution to it, they probably know it when, when they got there. Um, like if you wanted to write a program to do something, you know, either it does it or it doesn't when you're all done and you maybe have succeeded in solving that problem. But research is sort of taking a space of possibilities, issues, things that, you know, itch the mind, uh, you want to understand how to better deal with them. Like, for example, there's probably no issue that's hotter in Washington in the computing area than this big data problem that people are starting to focus on. And how would you go about describing big data in a way that a program could go munch on it and figure out what to do. I mean, set to it, see if in that data the following things are possible. Now, if you're asking it, you know, it's a list of people and there's Vint Cerf's name in there, that's one thing, that's hardly a research problem. But if you're posing a challenge like, uh, you know, some of the ones that the AI community has dealt with and they've 
come up with these really inventive expert systems to try and deal with it, and you wanted to say, go oh, figure it out automatically, we'll tell you enough about the data. What is it you would tell them? That's an example of, of, a, of a research kind of question, and there are probably much more abstract questions that you can ask. Uh, that, I mean, there are no answers, and when you're all done, it's not clear you've solved a particular problem because it's going to wait for people to see what they can do with the, what, you, what you did. And, and I have a very short uh, answer to that. Problem solving is problem solving, and research is trying to get problems solved. Very terse. I like that. <laughs> Ron. I'd like to, now let's try this again some other way. <laughs> is that better? There we go. So, uh, problem solving is only part of research. In fact, the most interesting and, and fun part of research is figuring out what are the right questions and interesting questions to be asked or solved. And, and I think uh, I'm trying to, you know, Turing was, was great at that. You know, what, is, what does it mean to be intelligent? What does computation mean and so on? The formulation of the questions is, is the, the joy of research in my mind. So here's an interesting one from Grant. It says, um, it seems that most security problems stem from the complexity in systems, features, and customization. Do we have to make a choice between security and freedom and features, or is it possible to have a rich and secure system? I assume rich by the richly functional and secure system. It's something that I am often asked, and uh, when I try to answer it honestly, I'm comparing uh, um, the security of my very first, I don't know, 30-year-old computer and the computer that I'm using today. And I have no doubt in my mind that the computer I was using 25 or 30 years ago was much more secure than the computer I'm using today. And the reason was very simple. The whole operating system resided on one diskette. I understood exactly what was the role of every single file on that diskette. When I uh, locked uh, that diskette, I knew that no one will be able to uh, uh, write any malware on it. So it was very simple, very well understood. Today, my computer is operating in ways which I totally uh, don't understand. Uh, it, starts firing up uh, the network at points where it shouldn't. The hard disk starts uh, wearing uh, furiously. I have no idea what my computer is doing. <laughs> so, much less secure today. So go back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Complexity makes it much, much harder. Not impossible, but much, much harder to have security. So we're back to a theme which we heard earlier, which is make things simple and it will make them more reliable and perhaps also more secure. Uh, here's another. Uh, Nobody will buy them. <laughs> Nobody will buy them. Get real, guys. <laughs> this is coming from Microsoft, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> You want me to give a mic to Butler? <laughs> right, we'll shave your throat, Butler. <laughs> this is nuts. There's a reason why these systems are so complicated. It's because that's what the customers want. We want Lots of people have tried right. making simpler systems, and guess what? So, people don't buy them. So, so At some I, point, I, they'll I, be I, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. At some point, they'll be sorry about their choice. There's Possibly so, but it hasn't happened yet. It, you know, I think there's probably one of the, this, the economists should love this. This is an equilibrium question. You know, will there be a Nash equilibrium between security, reliability, complexity, and functionality? Yeah, we have it and, now. And I don't know. We have it now. The market is now? doing it, and it's, That's of course it's I, an equilibrium. That's the reality is a bit more. Do they make equilibria? Oh. The reality is a bit more complicated. It goes up and down in cycles. So. A particular type of computer becomes more and more and more complicated. Think about the mainframes. And eventually someone decides that it's time to start over and have a simple personal computer on your desk. And then the personal computer becomes more and more and more complicated. And then someone decides to have a simple device that you can use only for a particular application. Uh, a telephone. And then the telephone becomes a smartphone, more complicated. And soon we'll see another uh, version. So I, I, I'm gonna, can I read Robert Butler's point? I mean, Butler's saying the market solves this balancing question. I, I claim that's not true because we don't know, in fact, what uh, is happening. The U.S. corporations are having intellectual property stolen left and right, and the people making the buying decisions for the computers on which those intellectual property are put don't understand the security properties of what they've got. And so the market is not a, a sufficient mechanism for getting the right balance point here. Okay. 
Would you like to come up on stage now? <laughs> they could choose to buy much simpler, much more reliable computers, and then they wouldn't have to worry about some of these problems. Guess what? They're not doing that. They don't know what they're buying. So, uh, you the know, government it, it, tried this with the Orange Book 20 years ago, right? And all the pe people in the government that actually bought, bought things overrode the decisions of all the people in the government who said that they had to be secure. That was the market in action. But, but I think, I the, think the, you the, the guys will have to share a beer out there. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's a and consequence of, of some of this uh, uh, discussion. This comes from uh, uh, Prakash uh, Narayan. People like Richard Clark are predicting that cyber warfare will cause catastrophes that will dwarf 9-11. We have the world's best computer experts in the room. What can we do to help? Now you should bring the microphone over <laughs> again. <laughs> Silence in the front row. So, <laughs> do you believe there's going to be a 9/11? Wait, hold wait, on, wait, hold on, wait. Hold on. We'll get a microphone for you. Well, how, how about just the first part? Do you believe there's going to be a cyber 9/11? Sure, we'll just won't notice it. <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm happy to respond. I'd be interested to hear what my uh, fellow panelists have to say. I think that there is a non-zero possibility of something very, very serious happening for the simple reason that we all appreciate how fragile these systems have become and how easy it has been to penetrate them, not simply because of technical weaknesses, but because of human weaknesses. I mean, the point that Addy made earlier is that when we trust, we trust people as well as uh, as the equipment and software and so on. And we know that many of the bad things that happen are a result of human foibles and compromise. So the more we depend on these systems, the more vulnerable we become. And of all the countries in the world, the United States might be the most dependent on these systems and therefore the most vulnerable. Bob? Yeah, I, 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 that's a very good question, but I would say that let me put it in hypothetical terms. If we get to the point where an attack on the U.S. could really have significant impact, a la 9-11 or whatever, then we're probably going to be in a position where many players that could do that will be uh, sophisticated players and will be one of them. So the likelihood is that if somebody could bring that kind of an attack on us, we could probably do it on them. And that's what the Cold War was really all about, this mutually assured destruction scenario. And that was sufficient to keep mutually assured destruction from actually happening. So I think we may end up in a, in a scenario, it's, high, it's possible, that our ability to do something to an adversary would keep them from doing something to us, and it's going to be only the sophisticated so players that would be able to. This is the digital nuke theory. Well, we can talk about that then, but I suspect that it's going to be a while before terrorists have enough capability to be able to do this kind of thing. But that's a hypothesis. I may be wrong. Okay, I have a simple question. What will happen if prime factoring problem is solved? Well, it's easy, right? RSA is useless. Uh, it depends on how it's solved, of course. If, if P is proven to be equal to NP, then prime factoring is solved, but then so are a lot of other things. Um, the real question is whether we should return the Turing Award. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, let's see. Let's go on. Uh, how can the theory of building reliable systems from unreliable components be used to improve computer security? I think the answer might be you don't think that that would help. No, you need to design, as I said in my remarks, you need to design systems so that the failure of components uh, is not fatal to the operation of the system. And I think that's, I mean, denial of services, you know, denial of availability is a key part of the security mantra. And, and uh, so reliable design is, is part of what you need to do there. I'm not sure there's much more deeper to be said about this. This, um, this feels like one of those things where the system has to work even when it's broken. I would like to expand on it because uh, we have to understand what does it mean uh, to work and work properly in the case of cryptography and security. So many of our newer attacks are utilizing uh, 
uh, all kinds of side information which is escaping from a properly working device. So the device is not uh, misbehaving, is not uh, doing anything uh, uh, which is not according to spec, and yet we are able to break the crypto system, which is running in that black box, because uh, the uh, power analysis is revealing some information about the key, because electromagnetic uh, emanation from the box is telling us something about the key, etc. So when we talk about uh, a secure device, it goes way beyond the question of whether it actually works according, according to spec. We, ju we just have difficulty in specifying what are all the things which are required in order to make the device secure. Okay, and you, no one else. Okay, so one more uh, question. Can you share your thoughts on privacy and security with respect to social networks? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, I, I'll give you, uh, you know, one comment. I, I was at a, uh, one of the universities in, uh, in Vilnius at the Internet Governance Forum, and it was with uh, one of your old colleagues, Andrew McLaughlin, and hosted by one of the faculty there, and we had a whole room of students in the audience, and they took a poll. Uh, you know Dave Farber has said that uh, one of his uh, least likely events is that I would actually get on one of the social networks. He's probably yeah. right. <laughs> but we, we had this event there, and Andrew just asked the group, how many in the audience use social networks? And every hand in the audience went up. These were young kids. Every single one of them. At that point, one of the kids in the audience looked at the panel, there were just the three of us there, and said, well, how many of you go on social networks? And two of the hands went up on the panel, Andrew and the professor, and they looked at me and said, why not you? And I said, I would be delighted to go on a social network as soon as it's part of an open architecture. And it was sort of left it at that. There's a big vulnerability on any of these social networks, as you know, when they're compromised. Uh, in an open environment, I think we would have a better chance of providing more in the way of security, although there's no absolute guarantees for anything. But I think that's one of the, the longer term issues that we've got to think about is does it have to be walled in gardens run by individual organizations? And how do you deal with those security issues? Or can it be done more broadly in an open architecture fashion so you feel confident that the information you're dealing with is sort of private to you even though it's socially available in some sense? So I, I think, thank you. Uh, I have the impression that we are, uh, as a species, very social and that uh, when we see new ways of interacting with each other that we are attracted to them, which is one of the reasons that some of the popular social networking systems have uh, gained so many users. On the other hand, the point that was made earlier, maybe, um, uh, maybe you made this one, uh, about the fact that people don't always know what they're getting, maybe you said that. So when, when you see something that helps you interact with others and you enjoy that, you want to share information that you have that uh, you think would be useful to others, but you don't necessarily understand all the implications of sharing it that way. Here's, here's a, a small example. Uh, let us imagine, uh, Addy, that you uh, are in Egypt and you are standing in front of the big pyramid of Giza and you want someone to take a photograph of you so that you can put this up on your social networking site. It could be uh, you know, uh, Facebook or uh, Google Plus or Flickr or something else. So somebody takes a picture of you, but it turns out Addy is standing next to you, you don't know who he is and you don't really care, you just wanted a picture of you standing in front of the pyramid. So you put the picture up. And then um, while um, Bob is roaming the social networks, which you probably wouldn't do, but let's imagine for the sake of this argument that, that you would do that, and you notice Adi's picture. He's not identified in the picture. But you know him, who he is, so you tag him. You mean his, fa his face isn't pixelated? Excuse me? His face wasn't pixelated by no, Google? No, his face wasn't pixelated, and so, <laughs> so he, he, might he might have been pixelated, but the picture was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now uh, you've tagged him as Addy, and uh, John now is, uh, is going on, he's looking for uh, you know, uh, pictures of Addy, and he discovers this picture, and it says uh, that it was uh, June 16th, 2012, that you were in, obviously, in Cairo in front of the pyramid, except that you had told John that you were in London that day. 
So now, as a consequence of the innocent photograph that was taken that you asked for, that Bob annotated, Addie is in trouble with John. And I think that what happens in these social environments is that we don't fully understand the consequences of what look like innocent actions because of this sort of cascade effect. And my guess is we're going to end up having to adopt, discover, and adopt social norms that we don't yet understand in order to cope with some of those problems. I think this is like raising teenagers. You, you don't know how to do it. You just live through it, and one day they turn into people. <laughs> So, uh, we are right at the end. I'm going to invite the four of you to step off the stage. Vint, I want you to stay after class. I will stay. Yes, sir. Good. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. So, as we wrap up here, Vint, just one or two takeaways from the meeting? Well, my first reaction to this is the most wonderful event that we could possibly have done because we got so many of the luminaries in our world together at the same time and we had a chance not only to listen to them but to meet them personally and talk to them. It's like the history books opened up and the people walked out. It's amazing. So that part. I mean. And I, I agree. And I'm going to ask you one final question and I'm going to ask you for a prediction or two about the future. But think about that for a second. I'll give you a moment. I, my takeaway, I really thought Dave Patterson captured it nicely when he said, life is pretty good when you can be friends with your personal heroes. And I think that's what this meeting was all about, was to give an opportunity for all of us to spend a couple of days together and be friends with our personal heroes. And um, I, you know, as a forecaster, I look for weird things that don't fit because oftentimes they're indicators or something. And you all know that the color of your punch cards was white or beige or whatever. But we got a couple of orange punch cards, real punch cards. And even though they were printed a long time ago, they still look brand new, which I thought, you know, this may be some indication about the strong Turing Church hypothesis, because I'm beginning to think there is a time traveler lurking in our midst who cruised in with these, and in fact, and, and his question didn't get answered in the last session because I had to hang on to it. It said, the universe is algorithmic, is a useful abstraction at some level, but in detail, at the quantum physics level, doesn't the universe behave non-deterministically? So I'd love to talk to whoever uh, is visiting from the past. Um, and in might that be visiting from the future. Or the I mean, future. That, yeah. Well, in that spirit, here are a couple of surprises I think we should think about for the next hundred years. Uh, the, the first surprise is that the singularity will arrive and we'll all get at life extension and we'll all be here 100 years from now. And we at that meeting will discover, in fact, we've answered the P equals non-P question. Uh, in addition, lambda calculus by then will be so worked out that they'll teach it in second grade. Um, <laughs> The bad news is that we'll have so many new puzzles that we're going to have to recycle the entire Greek alphabet several times over to put labels on them. And last of all, we'll still be talking about the Turing test. We won't have a computer that has definitively passed the Turing test, but we will have established beyond all doubt that most members of Congress fail it. <laughs> Your prediction, sir. Well. Based on all the things that I heard in the last day and a half, I'm imagining that there will be significant advances in computing and networking and cap you know, massive computing capability. And we will punch in the final question, and the answer will come back 42. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Teddy. I, I, you know, I'm sure that uh, John White will want to come up here and say thank yous, but I just want to personally thank Paul Sappho for spending a day and a half, to say nothing of the time ahead of time, for making this work. So, Paul, you were thank absolutely you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So, you John White, that? come on up. Uh, so I just, is this on? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, 
you think after a day and a half you'd realize that happens every time you hit it. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of the 108,000 members of ACM, we want to thank Paul and Vim. We want to thank uh, all 32 touring laureates. By the way, that's a new term that was suggested this morning by Don Knuth, rather than winners or recipients. Um, I think we all like the word touring laureates, as well as other panel speakers and panel chairs. Uh, and we want to thank you, the audience, for really getting engaged in this and uh, making it such a great event. Um, before I turn it back to Paul, I just want to give a couple of logistical announcements. Um, oh, first of all, yesterday's webcast is up and archived on the website. Today's will be shortly. Um, on logistics, several of you, I think, registered with the Computer History Museum to visit. Uh, they have a bus that will be someplace outside the hotel if you register to do that. Um, we are going to need to clear this room as we end because the hotel has another event that they have to start working on. But uh, for those of you, whether you're going to the screening or the Computer History Museum, there will be, even though it's not in the program, there will be some refreshments uh, and something to eat outside. And we won't start the Turing um, documentary for 20 or 30 minutes or so. So there should be plenty of time to mingle. And the Turing documentary is in the goal, is in the right to the right. I forget the name of the room. It's the next gold ballroom, gold ballroom just out here, straight on, on down the hall to the right. It's just right next to this room. It was the overflow room for folks who couldn't quite squeeze into this room or didn't want to sit next to whomever they were going to sit next to. Um, and uh, that will start after we, have, we take some time for a break, and it gives you your last chance to mingle. But we ask you to mingle out in the foyer and uh, take a picture or talk to people uh, and have something to eat. Thank you. Paul. Good. Thank you. Don't leave. Don't leave. We have a video. Uh, so um, uh, again, CHM buses will leave from the hotel. Anybody wants to do a photo op after this, please do them outside by the uh, 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 post. Uh, Keith and Reisbergen and Bill Newman, come see me after. Let's roll the video. Thank you.